I should totally leave that in because I'm sure it was at least mildly entertaining. Hello! And welcome to That's Who Speaks today, Wednesday, August 2nd. In this episode, well, let's just call it 200. Like, get over it. Not you, me. It's the afternoon, so I have the assistance of iced coffee. Let's move some zippers and make a shelf for myself. Okay? Okay. Hi, how are you? Um, I am Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry, and the Fat S-Q-R-R-L on Instagram. I'm sorry that I'm like, more light on this side than on this side. It's a little distracting to me. You probably were like, I hadn't noticed it until you mentioned it. Okay, first things first, because I always forget the, like, what am I wearing? Um, especially when it's not knitted things. I am wearing a dress number one made of double gauze, which I totally cheated. What? Can you see it? The, the double gauze is a little trickier to work with. I mean, it's not hard to work with, but it's a little stretchier. And so when I was doing my bias binding, my, it got a little bit, like, wanted to stick up here. Like, not stick up, but just kind of stuck, it just, it was like, put your Victorian bosoms, no, Victorian would not work. Hmm. Put your Parisian court bosoms up higher so that they will spill out of your dress number one, but only if they're this big, which doesn't work. It was like that. So I decided to just tack it down. Who am I trying to impress? I mean, you a little bit, but you know better. Oh, so I guess I could show you that. Ta-da! It's totally not washed. I mean, not ironed. Ironed. It's out of the washing machine. Just hung out to dry. Fat arms to boot. What? It's true. There's your exposure therapy for the day. Fat arms. They're okay. They still move stuff. Um. <laughs> oh my gosh. My chair is... <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm reminding you they're actually fat lady. I just said I had a fat arms chair. Get off my back! So in case you don't know what the dress number one is because you don't speak code, sorry. I forget you're not actually here and that you can't ask me questions when I'm not clear, so I just keep running on. Um, dress number one is a pattern by 100 Acts of Sewing, which is a company, you can just Google 100 Acts of Sewing, and dress number one is like a sleeveless I think it's like short of knee length, but I just make mine tunic length because I do enjoy a um, black yoga pant, the capri length. It's because I just need a uniform. Um, so I just make mine out of two yards of fabric, which is enough to get two lengths for me. I'm five, uh, apparently I'm not five eight. I've been living a lie. I'm like five seven ish. But. Okay, so the last time I went to the doctor, they measured me, but they measured me sticking my butt, like, okay, so you know when you go to the doctor, and there's, like, the wall thing with the, like, little slidey thing that measures how tall you are? Are we on the page together? Okay. So, for a normal human being, they're like, put your heels and your back against the wall, and then that's how tall you are. It's not a smooshy enough skein yarn. Okay. However, when you have a really big butt that's like this, and your body is like, hey, I'm a body over here. I really, I'm right in front of my window and I so hope the mailman sees me. Because he's already wondering what I'm doing with all this stuff. So anyway, so when you're like a person who's this tall, and they tell you to put your, and you have this huge butt, this is not really illustrative, but just work with me. I need, like, clay. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, put the little stick out and measure me, right? I'm sitting at the wall. They're like, no, you need to put your heels against the wall. Okay, but what happens is when you do that, now I'm no longer this tall because my trying to put my heels against the wall, like, actually reverses my curvature and makes me shorter. So I was pretending that's why they measured me short, short, which, which was, because they measured me, like, as five, six something. 
which is a lie. But apparently I'm not 5'8 either. <laughs> because we were measuring my daughter and she's like really close to how tall I am. And so we put me on, hi mailman, <laughs> we put me on the wall too to see, so she could see how far she had to grow to outgrow me. And uh, apparently I'm only like 5'7 and maybe a half. All my vertebrae are oxidizing, <laughs> or whatever they call it. Which is why I should really know, because we watch enough Time Team, that I should really know a lot about ossification of bones. Anyway. What were we talking about? So I'm 5'7-ish. It's a roller coaster, people. It's a roller coaster. I'm 5'7ish and I have a very I have a dispro I have a disproportionately long torso and really stubby legs like I can wear petite size pants usually. So I use a yard and that works out perfectly for me. You'll either need to buy I would either need to buy two and a half yards to get in the bias tape or just use a contrasting bias, which is what I often do. Um, but that's what I do for my personal self. Oh, I see, we haven't talked about it yet. So I did do the thing where I actually made the, sh the narrower shoulder. And um, like I made a couple sizes smaller in the shoulder, but just made this come out a little bit bigger because my body is, is deeper than it is wide. Like when they tell you to turn sideways in a photograph, not for me, sister. Most flattering, straight on. That's why this podcast is not done like this. We could do one this way. Anyway. So that's what works for me. The greatest thing about it is it's like no stress because, well, you're probably not like me and you probably don't have a metric ton of fabric in your life. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but not much. Um, it's my business. <laughs> anyway, so to like lose a couple yards of quilter's cotton or something is not terribly alarming to do a muslin with and so it's not so stressful. And again, it's one pattern piece. I may have mentioned that a million times. Uh, but it's so it's much less stressful to like alter because A, you can probably wear it under a sweater anyway, like no matter how much, how much you mess it up. But B, like it's like not, it takes like 10 minutes to cut out most, at most. One thing I did find out from people at SSK um, is that some of you are intimidated by doing these 100 acts of sewing shirts because there is the bias tape binding. So I'm totally gonna do it. Like there's a lot of videos out there on how to do it. And really I do the same way as somebody else's who does a video about doing bias binding. Not about 100, not about the dress number one, but about something else. Uh, but I will, I'm gonna say it out loud so I actually do it. But I'm gonna make a little bit like, like how I do it. I think, I think I can do that with my setup. Um, my machine's really loud, but we'll figure that out. Um, so just so that you can like maybe see a friendly face do it. Well, you won't see my face, but you can see some friendly fat hands doing it so that you'll be like, oh, she's a regular human. I could probably do that. And like, yeah, I know I sew for a living, but I sew only straight lines, yo. Only straight lines. Okay, so like we can do it. I think that's all. That is a double cost. It is. Double gauze makes awesome, and by the way, it's like so close to Moo Moo. So don't care. That's right. I feel cute when I wear it, and that's what matters. Back to this thing that we do. So this week's episode, okay, so I totally gathered my knitting for this episode, and I was like, oh gosh, I don't know if we have time to knit, get all this knitting together. There's like so little knitting. I felt like I've knit so much, and yet, apparently not. I've just been dream knitting. I have been spinning quite a lot. I'm almost done with my Hello Yarn patchwork quilt, which my plan is to chain ply, which I'm not very good at. Chain ply and then do like at least two of the, of the, um, I said it the other time. Foolproof cowls, a la Hello Yarn because I'm a total copycat, a single white female in her all over the place. But man, she's got like a navy blue or black house. I don't even know what it is, and it's amazing. Anyway, sorry, that's too much information, I'm creepy. Some of you write me emails, you're like, I hope you don't think I'm creepy, I'm like. 
Anyway, <laughs> so this week's episode will have knitting. It doesn't have any finished spinning, but like I'm so close to finishing so much spinning. I have some Knit Spin Farm and some Spun Right Round that are going to get applied together. Those singles are all done. I'm just waiting secretly to get, not secretly, I'm telling you. Okay, it's a secret, it's just between us. I'm waiting to get the Hello Yarn off of my Hanson because it has an 8 ounce bobbin and I want to just sing ply it into one bobbin. I know that's silly, silly, but I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. So that, and then it'll have some Shameless Self Promotion. And I think that's, how, oh, it'll have SSK stuff. Oh, I forgot my SSK stuff. What am I doing here? Anyway, so I have all that. So let's talk about, what should we talk about? Oh, we should talk about this first because I won't know how to fit this in otherwise. It's kind of like administrati. Um, I am actually going to go at, to Rhinebeck this year. Ah, I wasn't planning on it. Rhinebeck is New York sheep and wool, if you don't know. It's in October. It's in Dutchess County, New York. That's all the info, I think. Um, the beautiful folks at, I say folks, but <laughs> Legacy Knits, the Legacy Knits Fiber, what was it? Fiber Arts, okay, I can never remember which one the last two. Legacy Knits Fiber Arts, or it's just Legacy Fiber Arts. It's Legacy Knits Podcast. Anyway, they're the mother-daughter podcast from Vermont and Connecticut. And Andre Sue Knits, who does the insane sock blanks. Dude, you just gotta check them out because of that. It's crazy. So anyway, those super fancy people asked me to do a pop-up with them on the Friday before Rhinebeck. And of course I took two minutes to be like, okay, it took me two minutes, but because I wasn't planning on going to Rhinebeck, but then like that's such a good excuse to go, right? So anyway, so I will be participating in Needles Up this year, Friday, October 20th from 3 to 6 p.m. It's in downtown Rhinebeck. You can find the information on needlesup.com. And I am going to be there with bags. So many. I'm so excited to do like insanely fall bags and sheep bags. I have sheep uh, bags with the sheep and then the breed under them. There's going to be mermaid crazy bags that some of you saw at SSK and fell in love with. They're going to be there. I'll do teasers, but just like, you know, we're still in that planning stage. Actually, somebody was like, it's 11 weeks away. And I was like, oh my, what? And I kind of got freaked out for a second, but it'll be okay. <laughs> so it'll be me and all crazy stuff. And then Legacy and it's fi Legacy Fiber Arts. I did it again. They're going to be there with their crazy, beautiful, speckle-tastic yarns. And their cute faces. That's totally worth the price of admission. By the way, admission is free. There was like a special like early ticket in thing, but they're all done. So free admission from 3 to 6 p.m. And then the Andre Sunnits with her crazy sock planks. Then the fabulous knit cahoots, I rock knits, and stocking at zombies faces. Well, no, I bet both faces aren't going to be there. Sorry. Megan of stocking at zombies. Because <laughs> they just did their new book, right? Knit cahoots. They're going to be there to sign their book and probably sell it. And then I just found this one out. I don't know how to say this, but I think it's Sucre Sucre, the stitch markers of craziness. I totally have a burrito and a taco and something else. What? I don't know how these people got tricked into thinking that I was on their level of awesomeness, but don't tell them. Shh. So that's happening. What up in the future? What else is happening? Okay, I'm saying that's SSK stuff. Maybe we'll do SSK talk in the middle because I know some people don't like to hear talk about retreats because it makes them kind of sad. Did I say in the middle? I'm in at the end. Okay, but just in case you don't stick around for SSK, I do have to tell you what I've been watching because I am on it. Okay, I'm actually high on multiple things, but I can't tell you about all of them because that would be like the eight hour episode. But most recently, okay, but I really want to tell you about one thing, but okay, I'm just going to tell you. It's going to go out on a blim. Dude, do you remember talking about, I've talked about it before, 
Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Do you remember? I was born in 1978. It was on in the mornings, on Saturday mornings when I was a kid. And it was like when WWF was like a huge thing and like WrestleMania was happening. Like this is way pre the rock young people, pre that. So Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling was on Saturday mornings and I was in serious heart with it. I loved it so much. And so they did a documentary about GLOW a few years ago, which I'm sure you can probably still find on Netflix. But they have since done a like Netflix original based on GLOW. Warnings, triggers, um, abortion, miscarriage. If those things are like issuey for you, don't watch it. If you're freaked out, okay, let's like that's pretty good. I think an indicator. It okay. This is the better one. Well, this is an additional one. It is made by the creators of Orange Is the New Black, so it's racier than your average PG televisions. It's amazing. I love it so much. <sighs> anyway, there's other things too, but that one just. I was really conflicted whether I should tell you about it or not, but I put my stamp of approval on it. It's good. Anyway. But maybe also because I loved Glow. Mount Fuji forever. Oh my god, and the chick who plays the not, not Mount Fuji, I am in love with her. I am so in love with her. Anyway. Moving on. <laughs> The other thing I'm in love with right now is River Cottage. Have you watched that? It's like an old BBC Fo Channel 4 or BBC 4. It was like, I think it started in 1999. So it's been around for a long time. And I just didn't know about it because, hi, I live in Indiana. But I just recently found it for, for some other reason. I can't remember what I was looking for. But it's available on YouTube. And it's available on Amazon, but you have to pay for it on Amazon, which I might do because it's very enjoyable to me. Probably not. Anyway, there's like River, if you just search River Cottage season one, it'll start you off. But there's like River Cottage forever, River Cottage something else. Highly enjoyable. It's for hobby, hobby farmers, right? It's totally like, prettied up. It's not a reality television at all. I, I, it's gussied up. And this guy like has like a family and you never see them for like the first three seasons. <laughs> so like I understand that it is fantasy farming, but it's fantasy farming. I just started season four and it's getting very commercial. I don't know how I feel about it. But I'm in love with seasons one through three. There's pigs and chickens. At one point he breed he crossbreeds some chickens to develop better flavor and like he has a three-person panel of his friends come in then they all blind taste the chickens to decide which one is the best cross. Hi. <laughs> he has a friend who is like his uh, not they're not frenemies but they have like a comp he's very competitive this man. Hugh whatever his name is. He has like seven names. I'm pretty sure he's from money, but whatever. Fantasy farming. So he's a friend that he's out. So then they have like competitions, like the like their county fair, where they have like it's like intense competition about who has the longest bean. And his friend has had the title for like 12 years. So there's this whole tension about whether Hugh can grow a longer. And he has sheep. Did I mention that he has sheep? And he has a super awesome lady who comes in and delivers one of his lambs and she just like throws down. Like he calls her because the, the sheep is having trouble and it's a breech birth. It's not a breech, but it's upside down. So the when you look at the, the, shoe, the lamb coming out of the sheep, you should see the tops of its hooves. Okay, I am not a veterinarian. <laughs> And instead, you can you see the you can see the bottom of the hooves. So she just like okay, spoiler alert, but it's, she just like whisks in and like delivers that lamb. Then she like swings it to get it to breathe again, and then she delivers another one on top of it. What? 
So yes, fantasy fantasy farming, okay? Like he has magical friends who are somehow not compensated for all their awesomeness and still highly entertaining. I am in love with it. I am a woman of many pleasures. Glow and River Cottage. I'm probably saying the name wrong. It's River Cottage, right? Now I have to look up because I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it's River Cottage. Did I write it down? It's gonna take me too long to read my handwriting. I'm such a hot mess. It's highly entertaining. <laughs> so then, oh, also in family news. So those are all the things I'm in heart with. Since the last time we talked, kids are coming home from school, so I'm just watching random kids go by. <laughs> I don't care if they see me talking to nobody. Whatever, they're kids. They understand the YouTubes. Yes, okay, it's River Cottage. <sighs> okay. Um, Escape, to River, Escape to River Cottage is the first season to get you started. Um, so Tova, I don't, did we talk about last time that Tova had a urinary tract infection, I think? I think we talked about that. If we didn't, we thought, your to we thought did I say Tova? Olive. I'm just imagining my child and how humiliated would she would be if I were talking about her UTIs on YouTube. <laughs> She's okay. Olive, our dog. <laughs> I mix up their names all the time. <laughs> Whatever. Had a, what we thought was a UTI. Um, and so we, she was on antibiotics for it, but it wasn't getting better. And so the day, and it was a two week course of antibiotics. So I called the vet like in the middle of the course and said, she's still not getting better. And he said, well, you know, it's possible that it's just kind of a, you know, there's stuff happening. It's just not quite, and I'm like, cause she's only two. And so we did look up all of the things that what her symptoms could mean. Cause hi, that's what you do, right? And one of the things with bladder stones, but that's very uncommon in younger dogs, especially who've not had a history of UTIs, which as far as we know, she didn't, but Maybe she did and we just didn't know. Um, so we went back, I called the, the vet again after the, the day after the course of antibiotics was finished and said, something's still not right. Um, symptoms were medical stuff, fast forward a few minutes, blood and urine, frequent urination, and like somewhat strained or like, again, when she would, she would squat to potty, She would be there for longer than normal, and, and she would do it multiple times when she would go out. And when I mean frequent, I mean like, she would go out, and then it would be like 10 minutes later, and she'd want to go out again. So something was clearly not right. So we took her back to the vet. He palpated her bladder and was actually able to find bladder stones, which she couldn't feel before, probably because she had a fuller bladder or something, and he probably just wasn't really anticipating her having that, because it was very rare. Only 2% of dogs get UTIs per something on the internets. And, there's, and then the even less than I get these bladder stones. So it's not common. And again, not in a little dog. It's so young. So she had to go in for surgery. So I was wicked stressed out. I won't even lie. I'm totally one of those dog parent people. <laughs> I was like, I woke everybody up on the morning she had to go to surgery and made them all say goodbye to her just in case. I was really kind of a wreck. Not like terror, like I was functioning, but I was really stressed out because it's like a full surgery. Because I was like, well, can't you just use like some sort of ultrasound stuff to break them up? Like in humans, he's like, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> so they actually had to cut her open and take them out of her bladder. Luckily, they weren't in her kidneys too. They were just in her bladder. And there were four of them. Two of them were like as big as marbles. What? She's like the tiniest dog in the universe. I totally lift her up and show you, but... She did just have surgery like five days ago. And actually she acts like she's nothing wrong with her, but I'm still a little cautious. But that all said, she's A-OK. -okay. She probably has to go on some sort of weird special uber expensive dog food <laughs> because her like pH is wrong and whatever. We'll, fig we'll figure that out. They're being biopsied, the stones. Not for like cancer or anything, just to like figure out what kind they are because apparently there are multiple kinds of bladder stones. The more you know. Ding! Anyway. 
Wait, maybe I should hold up yarn to make the people know that it's okay to come back. No more medical talk. It was crazy. So we were super worried about her, but she's home and she's fine. She was a little groggy that night, but she had a little trouble getting up the stairs. But really by the next day, other than the stairs, you would have never known she'd had surgery. I'm like, I would have been whining for weeks. Dogs are awesome. <laughs> like, so I'm like, don't even think this is what's gonna happen if I have to have surgery for anything. No. Bring me ice cream and the internets. I'm not moving. Okay, I don't even like ice cream that much, but that seems like something you get to be fancy. She's okay now. Okay, so anything else? Toe was her back to school? I know, right? Oh, and then we painted our room. <laughs> See, this is like too much stuff. When I was kind of SSK, I like hammered into the family that they had to paint the front room of our house, which is like my work room, because it was going to be like a time where I was not going to be here and it could actually be painted. And then I realized that it was insane to ask them to do that when I was not there to like haul all the stuff out of that room. So I asked them to paint the other room because we have an arts and crafts house and all the rooms are really open and connected. So they painted the living room while I was gone. But then when I got home, we had to paint my room, which was terrible. In my head, it was like two days done. Five days, still not done. Okay, four days. Still not done. Our house is like 98% trim. Our walls are like this big. Everything else is trim. And of course I picked like a dark color and a light trim, so. What was I thinking? As I was painting the trim, I was like, oh yes, I remember being pregnant with Tova. That means we haven't painted for 10 years. That's totally reasonable, shush. As I was painting the trim, I'm like, oh yeah, I totally remember being like, I am never painting this trim again. It's easier than moving. <laughs> Not much. So, so I thought that would take like two days. No. It's insane. It's mostly done, but there's still trim that needs to be touched up. That said, I love it. Love it. It's like wedge woody blue. That's not the right color, but it's like a gray blue. And I'm in heart with it. But so between that and Olive and Toby getting ready to go back to school, and like, uh, is it crazy? So that's probably when I went to gather the knitting. There wasn't that much knitting. Even though I felt like there would be. <laughs> so that's a segue. Let's talk about knitting. Because that's totally what this podcast is about. Okay, let's start with an oops. So my mom called earlier in the week. I had knit my grandfather a pair of bootstrap socks. Um, that's from the book by... Laura Nelkin. Um, bootstrap socks. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is it like sock texture? No, that's not right. Recent. Sock architecture. I was close. <laughs> um, so it was by Sark, Sock Architecture. So it looks like that. By Laura Neal. And there is um, Laura Neal. There's a bootstrap sock pattern that I've only knit once. It was very pleasant. I just have happened to only knit it once. Um, and I made him for my grandfather. Well, I, so they told me a couple months ago that he had kind of worn out the heel. And I was like, well, just send them to me and I'll mend them. My mom called me. <laughs> She's like, um, your grandfather has completely worn out the bottoms of those socks. He has other socks that I've made him. But apparently, he just really likes these. I don't know. So, that of course means you have to knit that man's socks immediately. Let's use your pat ball. So I happen to have some hazel knits in the penny loafer colorway. It's showing up a little bit brighter. The camera is making it a little bit brighter. That's probably more accurate. It's kind of like the color of a penny loafer. Like a nice cordovan, cordovan, whatever the color is. But here's my sad. I got this far all the way past the heel. Like I just powered through it. That's from, this is like two days of knitting for me. That's a lot of sock. I'm not a huge sock knitter. And I was super jazzed. And then I realized after I did the heel that I made the wrong size. My mom even called because I told her to count the bumps. She call, called and told me it's 32. I should have written it down. 
And like, that's totally the standard sock size, right? 64 stitches around. That should be no problem remembering it. This pattern is written, she's, this is an awesome pattern, it's written for lots of different sizes. And for some reason, it's like 64, 68, 76. For some reason, in my head, I thought, oh no, she must have said 34, because 68 is the standard size. That is not a standard size. I know that. I forgot it for a few minutes, though, and those were very vital minutes. I knit this much on the wrong sock. Now, for anybody else, and really for, even if it just was like a random pair of socks for him, I would be like, too bad, I'll decrease those extra four stitches off in the foot, and like, there you go. But since these are the socks that he loves and wears to sleep every night, I feel like I can't pass off my four stitches too big around socks. So I felt like I needed to show somebody before I ripped them out. <laughs> I did do this much. Now I gotta rip it out. Also, it had to sit for like two days before I decided, which is so stupid. I lost, whatever. It took me a minute to really decide what to do. But anyway, so I'm gonna rip them out and start over with 64 stitches. <laughs> but here's proof that I did this much extra. <laughs> Double points, carbons, size zero. They're my favorites. I kind of go back and forth between double points and magic loop. I'm in a double point thing right now. Okay, so there's the knitting that I have to take apart. And here's like the only other knitting I have. I did work more on my um, worsted weight sweater that you saw last time, but like it doesn't look any different, so we'll try and get it next time. But this one does look different, I think. This is my, my husband is totally falling asleep over there. This is my weights cardigan. Oh, by the way, I was supposed to tell you that River Cottage Forever, season three, episode four, has felt making in it. This is my weights cardigan, which is by Bristol Ivy. She offers it, offers it in two directions. So I can't remember what the other one is called, but this is the weights in which you cast in its sport weight it is a short mitered cardigan. So you cast on, this is Volmisa, lace weight held double, okay? So Volmisa lace weight held double. It's Campari Orange and Terra di Siena. Apparently everybody knows what Campari Orange is because people at SSK were like, oh my gosh, is that Campari Orange? It totally is. So it's two skeins of lace weight. Sorry, somebody's mowing their lawn. Hell double. So in this version, you cast on what would be like a button band. It's not a button band because there's no buttons. And then you work and garter stitch back, and then you start adding in sleeves and transferring that section over to stockinette. So the sleeves in the back are knit in stockinette. And then once you get done with the sleeve cap, so you can see the construction hopefully here. You see it? That's the front. That you're, This is the back of the front. You're looking at the back of me, and I only have half a sweater on. Um, so now, once you get past the sleeve, then you're knitting like this rectangle where you're decreasing, decreasing at these points. So it has like a garter stitch that goes into, well, stockinette that goes into a point at the back. So I think you can tell, right? So there is another version of the same sweater that's knit the opposite way. So you start with that point at the middle back and then go out and around. Now, everybody at SSK who I told this about, and maybe even you, I can't remember when I first told you, I thought the back was a counterpane. Like, I thought you actually had the waistband, and then you were knitting, like, so that's one of the reasons I thought I would do it, because it would be just knitting in the round, and there would be no stockinette in the back. Uh, but I was wrong. <laughs> it is not that way. But you're getting less and less stockinette every time, so I'm just going to deal with it. There was a, I figured out a way to do it, like a more complicated way that involved no um, purling, but I decided it was probably not worth the risk. Because like you can do a system where you, so you're decreasing this garter down to make the point. So I could have like basically decreased and picked and like held a live stitch at the same time, like created a live stitch for every decrease and then gone and then like the rectangle knitted it down, but I was afraid it would change the way it looked and be weird. So we're just going in with this way. That was probably all Greek, I'm sorry. It doesn't need to be explained further. <laughs> but that's what that is. 
and I totally dig it. Also, I love this double full Misa in garter. It's magic, it's so squishy. So two lace weights held double can be either a sport or a DK. The Vulmaisa is a little bit heavier lace weight, so I think this is a DK, and my gauge is like 1.14 off, so, uh, and uh, percentage. So like my gauge would make a sweater 1.14 times bigger than the pattern says. So my, D, so my gauge is more like a DK gauge or something in between. Totally dig it. I didn't do anything additional for the, to try to make it bigger in the bust, it's just like an open thing. So, but I did add just a few short rows, like right here-ish, to maybe try to help it kind of come over a little bit more. I don't know how effective it's gonna be. Um, I The raglan, usually I try to increase faster, but I was afraid of how that was gonna work. Cause it's, again, it's really a strange construction. I mean, it's not strange, but it's just different. Um, so what I did is the pattern writ as written does not have any cast on for the underarm but I just cheated and did some cast on for the other underarm um, to help alleviate the slower decrease for my big fat lady arms. So they thank you again to the people who gave this yarn to me. Your faces are awesome. You're two different people. You gave me yarn to make a sweater with. That's my show notes. <laughs> okay, that's all the knitting I have. I know what else is possible. I was like, I must have started a shawl and forgotten about it. I've knit some baby washcloths, but apparently... Oh, I did bring them over. So I have some baby knitting to do. I didn't actually bring them over. Those are different things. So no, I don't have that, sorry. <laughs> So I do have some baby wash class. Maybe I'll show you next time. So that's all the knitting. So let's do shameless self-promotion really quickly. So in the shop right now are some bags that I brought back from SSK. Because if you don't know, I always do way more than I, you know, do as much as I can in the hopes I can bring some home. So here's what's in the shop right now. Like right now. Unless this is way in the future. And then just check. There might be something exciting. I went outside my box a little bit. So there's these cute little sock bags. Nice sweet little polka dots in them. But it's rose and gold, which I am excited about. And then these guys. So these are the lightweight twills, so they're not interfaced if you don't like interfacing. Um, they're really great to crunch up and put in a purse or whatever, or inside of another knitting bag. And then a sock plus size, which I do prefer when I'm using noodle points. How cute are those guys? Do you see how sleepy that bear is? Do you see his eyelashes? Do you see his friend Bunny down there next to that yellow tree who also has beautiful eyelashes? Do you see this house where the smoke in the chimney looks a little bit like Star Trek com badges? It doesn't really, but kind of. The rest of everything has an unbleached interior. Next up, in the small wedge size, we have what? a fabric that I don't understand and I'm in love with. What? What? Let's hold it back here because it's actually the, the light is making it look a lighter purple. But I'll show you closer so that you can see what it actually is. See, there's these hands. Some of them are reaching toward each other. Or are they pulling away? And then these, these other ones are in fact holding on. And then there's amazing moths and some of them have a little bit of orange in them because that's magic. So like, is it Victorian? Is it naturalistic? I don't know, is it goth? Fabric designers are awesome. Um, somebody did, I think, was a good, was a good question. Somebody asked why in the world they would put moths on their knitting bag. 
because as we know, there's a very small subset of the moth population that does enjoy eating our wool. But clearly, these are just a talisman to protect you against those, these, those moths. The wool moths see this moth, and they're like, oh my gosh, that moth is terrifying, and I cannot go anywhere near it. That is a totally false endorsement. I don't know that that's true. Okay, that's clearly not true. Don't put your knitting bag in a sea of moss and think that that will protect it. It won't. But it's magic. Then, in large wedge, oh my gosh, look at these guys. Look at this orange and teal chicken. What? What? That needs to be my tattoo. Not really, but I do really want a chicken tattoo forever. But look at him, I'm pointing the wrong way because things are reversed. Look at her! She's amazing! And then you're like, oh, pickles. Oh, beets. That's right. Some strawberries. What? Some peppers. Look at that color. I love that color. Now I'm just let her sit back. Oh, shush. What? It's like your nature study notebook, people, that you've never gotten around to doing because you're too busy knitting. Well, look, this fabric designer has clearly just made this for you. and moth protector right there. Just watch it out for you, man. Just watch it out for you. It's gonna scare those little moths away. It would mess with her. And then, gardening bag. What? Shut up. Nasturtiums, artichokes. Do you see this little guy? Is he really a fairy wren? How cute is that? Right. Cabbage moth. Wow, I did not realize how many of my bags had moths on them this time. That is a little strange. Just was a coincidence. <laughs> Just now discovered it right now. <laughs> yes, bees. Hmm. Are you ready for this one? That's right, that is Pyrex. That's Pyrex, people. I don't even need to say anything else. Also, these birds. What? <laughs> See how detailed and beautiful they are? What? That's all I'm saying. So those are all in the shop, ready to go, right now, to your faces. In the future, I'm gonna have a smallish county fair update. Oh, that's right. late for a county fair update, but my head is always at the wrong time for county fair. I've said this before, I apologize to repeat myself, but not everybody has watched every episode. When I was a kid, our Brown County Fair, which is the little, littlest state fair in Ohio, no. Little state fair in Ohio? It's not right either. Anyway, it's in September. And like, towards the end of September, I think. So I always get really confused when the fairs happen so early. My timing is off. But anyway, that's gonna happen on August 18th. So you can check Instagram, you can check the blog. I'll have information there about what will be in the update. And it always goes up in preview mood. mood. I usually try to get it around lunchtime, but sometimes it's more like dinner time. So, fair update, August 18th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Halloween update. Halloween update, August 25th, 9 p.m. So that's in the future, but just file it away back. 
just got in the Halloween fabric today. It's right there. It's super cute. Also, I'm getting an extra Halloween fabric because while I had already made my Halloween fabric order, a fabric designer totally released Halloween fabric with fat witches on it, so I had to get that. It's like political. I had to support the fat witchery. Okay. So my trip down to SSK was totally uneventful. Yay! As was my trip back, now that you mention it. Um, so that's a good thing. It was great. It's always fun. This is the fifth year I've gone. Is that crazy? It's totally crazy. This is the fifth year I've been, which means I've been doing this podcast for a long time. What? Um, but oh, it's just so great. And we had a lot, I had a lot of great conversations that were not about knitting. I mean, that's not to be, that's not a surprise. That's usually what happens. You are knitting. You don't necessarily talk about knitting. I mean, it's some, it happens, but it's not like the crux of every conversation by any stretch of the imagination. And so I had a lot of great conversations with folks about body image and like just the norms that we we're trying to uphold as women and like why we were trying to uphold them and how we try to like let go of them and like lots of mothers of both daughters and sons talking about different issues and lots of different generations of women talking about different issues. Um, but within the people that we had, had some great conversations about different topics and just like, I don't know, it's just really good to hang out with other folks and just talk about stuff. Why are you knitting? <sighs> Yay, knitting retreats. It was terrible, right? Oh well, I try. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to like encapsulate like what happens without doing like a blow by blow, which would not be entertaining for anybody. Um, but that said, I had great classes. I took lethal, I took a Lee Meredith's class about the Triang shawl. I will totally admit that I just took that class because I wanted to le meet Lee Meredith. Admitting it. But I am glad I took that class because um, one of the things that's a, an integral part of that shawl, which I do want to cast on, maybe that's why I thought I had done more knitting because in my head I've already started that shawl. <laughs> But there's like a couple of really great techniques that you can master within that shawl and then apply to other things. Whether you're doing, you know, whether you're doing um, design work or whether you just have like a problem like that sweater that I was talking about where I was like trying to figure out a different way to work the back so that I didn't have to purl so much. Um, so it's like really good like content for that, which you can get from the pattern, just doing the pattern, but actually having the person there and talking about it is obviously a different experience, which is very helpful. So that was great, and she was super nice. Super nice. Oh, she has a new book out. Did you see that? She's like a coloring book out because she's so fancy and graphic designery. It's not like a regular coloring book. She's too fancy for that. Um, it's called what is it called? Color Squared. You can find it at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. And it's really cool. It's like it's like a combination of like visual puzzle plus paint by numberiness plus like texture play all oh, it's very fun yay that and then i also took uh jillian marina's class which was about bats it was called bats and belfry i did not even know this why didn't you guys tell me you probably did not directly but i should have found out not only is she the author of yarn texture which i did know she's also the author of big girl knits what I've had those books since they came out, which was been like a long time ago. <laughs> I was like, dude, had I made that connection, I could have totally brought my vintage book collection in for you to sign. She was super awesome. I'm sorry. She was super awesome and very knowledgeable. And her, her class was like a great combination of just like casual conversation combined with technique combined with just awesome sauce. She had lots of awesome samples um, about different plying techniques with bats. Not so much plying techniques, and there was some of that, but different um, spinning techniques in terms of like how you break, I mean, because if you get a bat, and lots of times it's just like, what do I do with this? I don't even know. 
Like I can just start spinning it from the corner and just that's usually what I end up doing. But different techniques about how to combine the colors and like different uh, information about like what are the different, there are different kinds of styles of bats and like how you can ta tackle each of them and do different methods with each of them, which was awesome. Because like when I get a bat and you strip it out, I always spin with the grain. She's like, no, you can totally spin against the grain and get a loftier yarn. super fun and it's not fiddly like spinning over the fold which I don't like to <laughs> so that was a great class so if you can take a class with either of those ladies I highly recommend it um also poor Lee Meredith <laughs> she doesn't watch this podcast so I feel like I don't feel too weird about saying this but poor Lee Meredith got suckered into going to dinner with me and I have no air conditioning in my car and it's Nashville in July so I should probably buy like seven of her books as an apology. <laughs> and we like drove around forever because it's a million degrees and there was no parking. We went to park at one place and there was $35 to park there. And it was still like three blocks where we were going. $35. There was clearly some event happening in Nashville that we were not privy to and it was not our event. $35. So we had to leave there and like drive around and then I took them up this alley that was far too narrow for us to drive in and they might have all peed a little bit that's okay I didn't check and we had to drive this little tiny skinny alley and I was like in my crazy mom van I'm a good driver but I feel like I didn't prep them enough ahead of time like I have never caused an accident like I am not a bad driver but you may not know it from the next 20 minutes of your life <laughs> They're driving up alleys trying to find parking. And then finally we found a place to go that had valet parking, which by the way, I did not tell them, but I've never done before. So I just pretended like I knew what I was doing and it totally worked. <laughs> I was a little intimidated, but luckily by that time I was like, just get us into the restaurant. You know what I mean? So I totally valet parked my 2000 Chrysler minivan with no air conditioning. <laughs> it was very fancy. It was not the fanciest place. It just happened to have valet parking. So, that was the first for me. Because <laughs> I'm a rube. Okay. Okay. So it was super fun. The marketplace was awesome as always. Last year I traded for um, my weight in yarn and I'm super fat so it was a lot of yarn. This year was not the season, as little Amy Laura says, it's not the season of me consuming large quantities of yarn. So my, my, I traded for one thing, well let's see, two things, but it's one thing, and that was all I did. It was so tempting. It was such good stuff. Wait, I totally forgot that I bought this. It's tufted woolen perfume and the sugar weight, the sugar cane scent. It's really nice. And there were folks there that I've never seen before, like Hip Strings at Hopkins Studio and Lollipop Yarn was there. I know, right? Where's my medal for not spending my mortgage payment? Oh, that's me living in a house. <laughs> <laughs> but so I did trade Hobbledy Hoy. This is the oh, Raspberry Lime Ricky. What? It's pulver silk. It's very pretty. But I mean, in reality, I have not consu I have not used up all the fiber in yarn I bought last year or traded for last year, and so. There will always be amazingly beautiful things. Okay, so then this is, I won't show you everything that was in the goodie bag because you know, but there's the, gro there's the shopping bag for this year. Oh, for the market, how fancy are these Knit Girls ladies? Whatever, so fancy. And then this is the actual retreat bag. Fanciest ladies ever. 
and here's the retreat fiber. It's Into the World, Tinkerbell's Unmentionables, and it's from Falkland. Isn't that pretty? Of course, Into the World is always gorgeous. But yeah, super restrained, people. Super restrained. But please do understand, it's not because everything was not gorgeous, because everything was stinking gorgeous. There was like this Miss Babs um, kit for the starting point, the Hoagie Locatelli shawl, which I do not want to make. Um, it's just beautiful. I just don't want to make it. I don't like rectangles. I don't know why. So there's this beautiful, and it had like, it had the color that I've been wanting. It has like this like mustardy weird color that is like the honey color from, not like it, but similar. It's that mustardy honey color. And like this bright aqua and like a dark teal that's like this color teal and like some other colors and it was right next to my booth and I just kept looking at it all day. But I kept telling myself, you cannot buy that when there are a million other things that are equally gorgeous. Also, you don't need that. <laughs> but like, how can I buy that and not buy all of Lollipop or buy all of Marigold Gin or buy all of Jinx or buy all of Nidian Color. So, again, not because everything was not absolutely gorgeous. It was just not the season of me owning it all. <laughs> so it was a hoot. It was a good time. Oh, I didn't need to show you that though. As part of um, Julie Marina's class, the bats and the belfry, we got all these crazy bats because we were learning all these techniques on bats. Right. So like, all these bats, these are two different bats, people. Don't get too crazy. But like this crazy arty bat and then this orange bat. And the best thing is she puts them out on the floor and then you get to fight over them. It's like gorgeous ladies of wrestling. This one is like blue on the inside. I don't want to take it apart. I have so much fiber on me. But one of the coolest things ever, this is like so not part of the class, but it was so cool, is you do, um, since you're doing samples and most of them are just singles, I mean, you can certainly do like indie and ply and ply back. And, I don't know how to do that really. I should probably learn. Somebody's going to know I'm not a real spinner if I don't do that right. Um, but you can't just leave everything as singles, um, your samples for class. So, you know, when you spin a single, it's very normal for it to look like that. That's totally legit. Because it doesn't have another ply to balance it out. But she just had this like little steamer in the room for you to steam your singles. I kid you not. It's, I really, I kept trying to video it, but it just it doesn't work, it didn't work. But like, I mean, meaning that I couldn't like line up how to do it. Not that I tried to do it 75 times. And, but you, this turns into this. It's just like, you just pull, you just put, you just like hold the steamer over it. And like, you can see the yarn instantly relax and plump. It is so cool. The class was very good, don't get me wrong. But that was awesome. It's like totally like Mr. Rogers level factory tour awesome. was a really random tie-in that made no sense even to me as I was saying it. But I'm just, I was excited about it as that. <laughs> so yay! Okay, I think that's all. What? It's true. Alright, I'll talk to you next time. Bye!